Maybe it's up with the stars. Maybe it's under the sea. Maybe it's not very. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm uh, Hannah Fry. I'm a mathematician, uh, and today I want to talk to you um, about love. Now, I know what you're all thinking, uh, and you're right, mathematicians do make excellent lovers. <laughs> um, but it's not just because of our dashing personalities and superior pencil cases. Um, it's also because we've actually done an awful lot of work into the maths of how to find the perfect partner. Now, in my favorite paper on the subject, uh, entitled, Why I Don't Have a Girlfriend, um, Peter Bacchus tries to rate his chances of finding love. Now, Peter is not a particularly greedy man, right? Of, of all of the available women in the world, all he's looking for is somebody who lives near to him, uh, somebody of the right age range, uh, someone with a university degree, someone he's going to get on well with, someone he's going to find attractive, uh, someone who's going to find him attractive, <laughs> <laughs> and ends up with an estimate of 26 women in the entire world, right? <laughs> um, now, just to put that into perspective, that is around 400 times fewer than the best estimates for the number of intelligent extraterrestrial life forms in the galaxy. <laughs> um, not looking particularly good, is it, Peter? Um, now, OK, let me be honest with you. I know, just as well as all of you do, that love and maths don't naturally sit that well together. Um, human emotion, unlike mathematical equations, is not neatly ordered, rational, and easily predictable. But I also know that that doesn't mean that maths hasn't got something that it can offer us. Because the certain je ne sais quoi aside, our love lives are full of patterns, from how many people we date in our lifetime, to uh, when we decide to settle down, all the way through to the spirals of negativity um, in long-term couples. And all of those are patterns which mathematics is uniquely placed to describe. Now, OK, I've only got 15 minutes, so what I want to try and do is give you just a little flavor of how insightful a little bit of mathematical thinking can be even to something as mysterious as love. And actually, Peter Bacchus's equation is quite a good place to start. So here uh, is the breakdown of how he ended up with that figure of, of 26 women in the world. Um, now, you could look at this and, uh, and get a bit depressed, let's be honest. Um, or you could use this as a starting point to ask some slightly uh, deeper questions. For instance, looking slightly more closely at this, um, Peter Bacchus says that he only finds 5% of people attractive. Um, now, maybe I'm just not that fussy. Um, <laughs> but I think that's a bit on the low side, so I'm going to change that to 20%. And you can immediately see that suddenly there's more like 100 people um, available. Also, you may notice Peter Bacchus is insisting on somebody with a university degree, which, if you ask me, is a bit snobby for someone with basically no chance of finding a lover. <laughs> um, so getting rid of that, getting rid of that. And we're already up to 800. And I'm sure you can imagine just how much this number would grow if he was willing to, say, uh, date someone outside of his own city, for example. Um, but actually, opening yourselves up to new opportunities, new potential, uh, or, or new people, sometimes is the opposite of what we do when we're single. So many of us have a checklist of criteria that we're just not willing to budge on. Um, and in fact, when I was researching um, my book on this topic, I came across one guy in particular on OkCupid um, who had an extraordinary checklist, right? A, a list of deal breakers that he was just not willing to consider in any potential partner. Um, so here is that list, um, <laughs> as you can see. Just to give you some highlights, just to give you some highlights, um, you have tattoos you can't see without a mirror. Um, <laughs> You think world peace is actually a goal of some sort? Um, and my particular favorite, uh, you demand respect, but would also happily become a trophy wife if the money were good enough. Um, I think that one counts me out, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> now, this list, right? This list, this list goes on, right? This list goes on and on. <laughs> <laughs> and on. Now, I want you to imagine taking all of those criteria 
uh, and, and feeding them in to Peter Backus's equation. You know what? I'm going to get rid of that. It's, it's, it's too brilliant. It's too brilliant. Okay. I really want you to, um, uh, to, to imagine taking all of those things and feeding them into to Peter Backus's equation. Because actually, a lot of us, when we set ourselves a checklist, don't realize that we're narrowing the possible pool of potential partners, often setting ourselves a completely impossible challenge. Add to that that in 80 years of relationship science, there is no evidence that an individual checklist, an individual set of criteria for your partner, can be used as any kind of predictor for compatibility or long-term happiness. Quite simply, we do not know what we want until we find it. And so that leads me then to my first mathematically insightful tip, if you will. There really is no point in having a checklist. Um, now, if, if we do have a checklist, if some of us do have a checklist, often at the top of that is appearance, it's something that a lot of us care about. And uh, if all of us can agree that certain faces, perhaps a Hollywood celebrities, are beautiful, then surely there must be something about beauty that you can define. Now, one candidate for this, one mathematical candidate for this, is the uh, golden ratio, which some of you may have come across before. Um, but if not, the golden ratio is an irrational number um, that comes from the problem where you have a line um, and you split the line in such a way that the ratio of the smaller section to the longer section is the same as the ratio of the longer section to the original line itself. Now, with these two sections of the line, you can create a golden rectangle, which is said to be the most aesthetically pleasing rectangle. You can also use the golden ratio to split up this rectangle and create a spiral, uh, giving you the most aesthetically pleasing spiral. Um, and this golden ratio is said to appear in the faces uh, of very beautiful people. So, for example, uh, a beautiful person would have an eyebrow that was 1.618 times the width of their eye, uh, a mouth that was 1.618 times the width of their nose, um, and so on and so on, you kind of get the idea. Now, it's also said that Leonardo da Vinci knew about this number and used it in his paintings, as you can see here with the Last Supper, with the golden rectangles uh, placed on top, and also that the Greeks knew about this and deliberately used it in their architecture. Now, you will find this theory in hundreds and hundreds of blogs and videos online, but also even BBC documentaries, and it all sounds so convincing until you dig a little bit deeper. Like, for instance, why does that rectangle start at a completely arbitrary point at the base of the path on there? Uh, why does it not touch the sides or the top? Uh, and also, sorry, what is that spiral actually supposed to be telling me <laughs> about Greek architecture? Um, unfortunately, taking pictures of buildings and paintings and just overlaying rectangles on them to prove a theory is quite simply um, not science. Um, likewise, when it comes to the face, uh, how do you decide where your ear starts, right? Or how do you decide where your nose definitively ends? And how do you measure that to such a degree of accuracy that you can get five decimal places or more? Believe me, there is no one in the world who would like beauty to be defined by a single number more than me, but I'm afraid taking thousands of ratios uh, over thousands of faces and getting excited when you find something that comes close to 1.6 um, is, again, uh, not science. Um, there is no evidence that the golden ratio uh, uh, defines human beauty. And, but just in case you don't believe me, um, here is a particularly famous face which can be photoshopped and adapted um, according to the golden ratio. Um, and I think we can all agree, <laughs> definitely not more attractive. Um, okay, but there is one, uh, one mathematical idea that is related to beauty, and that is of uh, facial symmetry. Um, now, it's said uh, that the reason why we're attracted to people with symmetrical faces is that when you're a child, when you're growing up, every time you get a cough or a cold or a sniffle, your face grows slightly asymmetrically. So that we're evolutionarily pre-programmed to be drawn to people with naturally symmetrical faces, because what we're doing is we're validating an underlying bill of health. So Tom Cruise here, with a very, very symmetrical face, um, clearly had very few childhood illnesses. Um, but while we're here, Tom Cruise isn't perfect, uh, because I don't know if you've noticed this before, Tom Cruise basically has one tooth literally in the middle of his face. Um, <laughs> amazing. Um, but the <laughs> You'll never look at him the same way again. <laughs> um, 
But while it's true that people with naturally symmetrical faces are considered beautiful in surveys of this kind, you can't take somebody without a symmetrical face and make them more beautiful by, um, by mirroring their face. So to give you an example, um, here is, uh, let's be honest, probably the most flattering image of me ever taken. Um, <laughs> and you can see here, when you split it and flip it uh, like this, um, you can see that what ends up is just actually something that makes me look like a bit of an alien. Um, <laughs> clearly a very sickly child. Um, that's what um, but the thing is, while uh, you can't take someone without symmetrical face and make them more beautiful by, by applying a mathematical rule, um, all of this only applies to static images of people's faces. When it comes to videos or meeting people in the flesh, actually, we prefer asymmetry in their face because it's seen as more authentic. And that's the thing with beauty. Every time there's a rule, there's a counter rule. Every time there's an example, there's a counter example. As much as scientists have tried, we still don't have a catch-all definition for why some people are attracted to other people. Ultimately, whatever you look like, someone's going to fancy you. So that's my second tip. Mathematically speaking, at least, um, beauty really isn't everything. Um, now, in case I, I haven't convinced you on this, in case you're still unsure, um, let me show you uh, some data on this very point um, from the dating website of OkCupid. Now, OkCupid is a really interesting example because it was founded by a group of mathematicians. And so they've deliberately built in lots of sections to their website which allow them to essentially experiment on their customers. Right? Um, and this section in particular is where you're allowed to rate how attractive you think other users are on a scale between one and five. So one being the lowest and five being the, the hottest. And this is how uh, m uh, men on OkCupid rate women. This is just for heterosexual couples in this example. Now, if you look at this, actually, you know, it seems kind of sensible, right? The mean is in about the right place. You've got nice tails on either side. It's kind of a good bell curve, right? Really, what this graph is saying is actually, when it comes down to it, men just fancy women. <laughs> By contrast, <laughs> would you like to see how women rate men? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> slightly different, slightly different. Uh, in fact, women on OkCupid okay think that men are so unattractive that they will only give one in every six guys an above, uh, above average attractiveness score, which I quite like. Um, we will still go out with you guys, though, so it's totally fine. Um, but what's interesting about this section of the website is that once you have it, you can then use it to ask uh, slightly deeper and more interesting questions. Like, for example, these perceptions of attractiveness, how do they relate to the number of messages individual users receive? Um, and this kind of, uh, this is a graph of the results. So attractiveness along the bottom and the number of unsolicited messages per month for 5,000 users at the top. Um, to give you some sort of a sense of how beauty relates to popularity in an online dating context. Now, the first thing that you notice about this graph is that it's certainly not true that the more beautiful you are, the more attention you receive. Right? Maybe there's a little bit of a trend there, but it's got an R squared of absolutely naffle, let's be honest. Um, but you have to ask yourself the question of what is it about uh, people up here that's so different from people down here who are receiving so many more messages despite being considered the same level of attractiveness? Um, now, this is something that only a mathematical model can answer, um, but it's best explained by way of an example. Um, okay, so someone in this group down here might be someone like Wilma Flintstone, right? Now, we can all agree that Wilma Flintstone is a very beautiful character, a very beautiful woman, right? Uh, nobody would say that she's ugly, but she's not exactly Jessica Rabbit either, right? Um, by contrast, someone up here might be someone like uh, Leela from Futurama. Now, uh, a lot of people, myself included, think Leela is seriously sexy, um, but some other people might be a bit put off by the whole one eye thing, you know. Now, I reckon if you ask people how attractive they thought these different women were, um, you'd end up with an average score that was about the same. But the way that people would vote would be very different. Wilma would have scores clustered around the four, but uh, Leela would very much divide opinion. 
Now, it turns out that it is this spread that counts. The people who do best in online dating websites are the ones who divide opinion. Um, now, this begins to make sense if you think of it um, from the perspective of people sending the messages. If you come across somebody uh, who you think is, is attractive but suspect that not everybody's going to fancy them, you, you know, it's, it's sort of an extra incentive for you to get in touch that you imagine them having not, not much competition for your messages. But if you come across somebody who you think is attractive but suspect that everybody's going to find them attractive, I mean, you know, why would you bother humiliating yourself by adding your hand to the pile? But the results for this, or, or the tips for you, are twofold. First off, if you come across somebody who is generically attractive, the chances are they're getting a lot less attention than you might expect. So it's worth a go. Um, <laughs> but second, and more importantly, when people choose their online dating profile pictures, they often try and pick images that minimize whatever they think makes them seem unattractive. So classic examples are perhaps people who are a bit overweight, deliberately choosing very cropped photos, um, or gentlemen who are bald, wearing uh, hats in their images, that kind of thing. But actually, this is the exact opposite of what you should do. If you want to stand out online, you should play up to whatever it is that makes you different even if it's something that you think makes you unattractive. Because the people who fancy you will fancy you anyway, and the other unimportant douchebags who don't will only play to your advantage. So, okay, that was just a little flavor of how far a, a mathematical insight can take you, and there are many, many, many more examples beside this. Because the thing is, Maths isn't a thing that just exists in dusty textbooks. It's a living, breathing language that opens up the world around us, from how planets move, to how robots are built, to how we humans behave. And so, sneakily, I hope that a little bit of insight into the mathematics of love might just persuade a couple of you to have a little bit more love for mathematics. Thank you very much.